All right. Hello and good morning, everybody from beautiful Vancouver, Canada. My name is Cyrus Jansen, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's live stream. It has been a long time since I've actually done a live stream, and I'm so excited to be here. And uh, let me just get the little housekeeping things underway. So, yeah, it's been about three months since we've done a live stream, and I wanted to come to you because I have a very important topic that I wanted to discuss, and that really is uh, the future of human rights. Uh, we often hear about this human rights uh, you know obviously the united states uh, we tend to be the champion of human rights uh, we you know we have um, you know we like to lecture countries around the world about human rights uh, we have a lot of human rights that needs to be addressed inside the united states but we also have other countries that are big players in this and i want to basically today's today's live stream we're going to last about an hour and I have a lot of things that I want to say because there's also a very interesting story that's happening in a in the sports world right now. I think many of you who do who have followed me for a long time, uh, you know my background. My background is as a professional golfer. Um, I've spent many years in that industry. Uh, and there's an interesting thing about human rights, uh, Saudi Arabia. If you have been following that as well, and also. I basically want to talk, obviously, this channel, we focus tremendously about China, and we need to talk about human rights. We want to talk about a recent United Nations visit to Xinjiang. Obviously, Xinjiang has been a very controversial topic over the last uh, few years. I think it's really important that we address some of these. So I want this to be a very interactive uh, live stream today. Uh, if you have questions, definitely uh, throw them down in the comment section, and we're going to answer those. And today's uh, today's topic, I just kind of thought about this last night. Uh, that's when I put the stream together. And, you know, it was mainly more for me to kind of get back in the game and spend some time with you guys on YouTube. Uh, you know, March uh, was actually the last time that I had a discussion, a, a live stream. I remember we were I, I invited uh, Danny Haifong. We discussed uh, Russia and Ukraine and kind of the interesting developments that are going on there. And so... Yeah, let's just go ahead and jump right into it. So first of all, thank you all for, for joining here this morning. We just passed over 100 people here. And uh, I'm going to just go ahead and kind of look through our um, through our chat here on the side. i got a lot of regular names that we see again. Uh, Mansana, always good to see you, my friend. Uh, Wu Jiao, U.S. is the champion of human rights. At least we like to say we are. You know, we, we that's the message we like to portray. Um, I do have a huge birthmark on my right arm. Yes, that is from birth. Um, uh, and then we've got uh, Senjo, uh, also a regular subscriber here. Um, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I think what's really important with human rights, and I want to just kind of talk to you know, you know, there's an interesting thing that there that we that we, we need to discuss. And what I want to do is I'm going to talk to you first about I'm going to show you a clip from Jimmy Carter. Uh, this is a clip that I found a few years ago. And I've kept it for a while. I think it's really important, but I want to basically let's start off today's video by showing you this clip from uh, former President Jimmy Carter. My question is, in your opinion, Mr. President, does the United States have grounds to push China to observe human rights considering the Guantanamo Bay and wiretapping incidences involving the United States? <laughs> no. <laughs> if we based our... Uh, Commitment to human rights on the recent performance of America at Guantanamo and in Al Ghraib prison and the abuses that have been perpetrated against American citizens under the George Bush administration, we would not have a right to criticize anyone else. But uh, they are international uh, commitments, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that was uh, adopted by China and others when they became members of the, uh, of the United Nations. So China has signed the same very high standards for international human rights observance that has the United States. And just because the United States has violated its international commitments in recent years doesn't mean that China ought not to treat the ethnic groups that I mentioned particularly the Tibetans and the Uyghurs, uh, with great uh, care and attention. So I think it's good for the United States to remind China and other countries as well, and to remind ourselves that all aspects of human rights needs to be uh, observed and violations need to be pointed out and corrected. 
But based on what happened in the previous eight years, we don't have a right to criticize anybody. Okay, so really interesting clip here from Jimmy Carter. And let's go ahead and break this down because I think there's some really interesting points that he brought up and some things that I think we need to discuss. Number one, uh, one of the things that we see is, is Jimmy Carter is one of my favorite presidents because during his reign as the United States president, it was really a, a period of time where the United States was not involved in a direct international conflict. Um, you know, this, this is very rare for the United States. Uh, Jimmy Carter, another quote from him that I often cite is, you know, he says the United States is the most warlike nation in the world. Uh, we, we've seen this continuously. You know, we go around the world. Um, you know, it's not rare for the United States to go in and overthrow governments, install coup governments, basically manipulate other governments around the world to, you know, basically in the in the economic interest of the United States. Uh, recently, I've had some very well-performing videos where I've highlighted this. You know, I've highlighted, for example, why are Pacific, Asia-Pacific countries, why are they choosing to work with China as opposed to the United States? Uh, you know, a video that did very well recently was my video about the Solomon Islands. And why, for example, why is the Solomon Islands, why do they want to have a security deal with China as opposed to not dealing with Australia? Now, the Solomon Islands, very small Pacific Island nation, obviously in the vicinity of Australia, it would make sense that they deal with Australia. Uh, for many years, they did deal with Australia, but unfortunately, they just weren't given enough um, importance. You know, Australia basically overlooked them as too small. They didn't listen to their needs. And, you know, even the United States, you know, they would not even have, they don't have an embassy there. They don't have an ambassador there. They basically don't have any, want to have anything to do with the Solomon Islands. And the difficult thing with is even the Solomon Islands, you know, that was used strategically in World War II. Uh, there's tens of thousands of uh, bombs that are still on the Solomon Islands that, that every day civilians walk out and they step on these bombs, they get killed. And the Solomon Islands have been protesting to the United States, you know, for 80 years. Can you guys please come in here and remove these these bombs from World War II? And, you know, we, we, we just this is this is 80 years ago. You know, we're still you know, we have normal civilians that are dying every day because of this. And it, it was interesting. It wasn't until China came to the table, said, you know, what we're going to do. We're going to build an embassy. We're going to have an ambassador there. We're going to build this economic relationship with you. And then all of a sudden, the United States said, oh, you know what we need to do? Um, why don't we send our ambassador over there. We're going to send, uh, I think it's Kurt Campbell's the gentleman's name, uh, who's kind of in charge of the Asia Pacific. He represents the U.S. government. And all of a sudden the U.S. came, well, how about we, uh, how about we take away these bombs for you? How about we do this? How about we do that? A little bit too little too late. And again, you know, it was just a reaction. China came in and listened to the needs. And then the United States finally said, well, let me, let me try to actually help out. Uh, we've seen this in Latin America. I highlighted this again um, in another video, why China is brokering all these deals, the Belt and Road Initiative around the world. And, and it was interesting, there was a, um, the author of the book, Econo uh, The Confessions of an Economic Hitman, he said, why is it that Latin American countries are willing to deal with China as opposed to America? And they said, it's just simply history, right? If we look at the history, we can see that, you know, when China comes in, you usually get a tangible asset. You're usually getting investment. And when the United States come in, you you know, what we get is we get a lot of lectures. We get, um, you know, usually there's a military coup involved, an overthrowing of our government. And essentially, there's a lot of economic you know, instability there. So it's, it's a really interesting contrast between how the United States and China kind of go around the world and what they do. Now, I'm not going to come out and say that everything China is doing is perfect. Uh, if we look at the Belt and Road Initiative, sometimes some of my critics say, well, there's been many projects that have failed. Um, you know, and I said, yeah, well, if we look at it this way, China is doing, let's say, about 1,100 different Belt and Road Initiative projects. Um, I like to look at it almost like an investment portfolio. Uh, you know, diversification is the key thing. If you have 1,100 projects around the world, some projects are going to fail. They're just not going to work out. Some projects are going to succeed. Some are going to be middle of the pack. It's kind of like investing, right? You don't buy one stock. You buy 20 stocks and you have that diversification in your portfolio. You know, some stocks will end up losing money. Some stocks will be a big winner. Some will perform averagely. But hopefully within your portfolio, you have a decent return. And that's exactly what China is doing, you know, with this Belt and Road Initiative, which, again, you know, if you are increasing the amount of trade that you're doing with China, if you are really talking about economy, economics, 
these are the tangible results that people can get that really do improve you know people's lives and that is a, a big thing of of human rights that i that i wanted to address um it's it's really interesting to to just hear and kind of observe everything that's going around in our world right now and i want to talk I want to talk a little bit because I, if you saw my thumbnail image, I have three people on the th thumbnail image, right? We have Joe Biden, obviously the president of the United States. Uh, we have Xi Jinping, president of China, China, U.S. These are these two countries are often involved in, in human rights discussions. But we also have uh, MBS, which is Mohammed bin Salman, who is the crown prince, the de facto leader of Saudi Arabia. And, and this is a really interesting thing for me as an American, because there's a story that's been going on inside of America that has really, um, you know, just completely lit, lit up the sports world. And I want to, and I, I find it relevant. So I want to do bring this up and kind of educate everybody about this. You know, a lot of people don't understand the United States relationship with Saudi Arabia. Um, Saudi Arabia and the United States have had a very close relationship uh, since 1945, just after the Second World War. And the United States economy completely depends on Saudi Arabia oil. So what we do is we basically have a, a deal with Saudi Arabia. Uh, you're going to provide us with oil. Uh, in addition to that, you're going to agree to only sell your oil in US dollar. And for that, what we're going to do is we're going to provide protection for you. And essentially what we're going to do is we're going to overlook any of your human right abuses or any of state sponsored terrorism in Saudi Arabia. We're, we are going to completely forget any of that simply because you are going to provide us with the oil. And this has been the arrangement for many, many years. Um, you know, we've had a very close relationship with them. And what's interesting is, is that we have this thing of cancel culture that's coming now into the sports world. One of the things that's interesting is in the golf world, uh, and I'm going to keep this very generic because I know not met, not everybody here follows golf and, and I don't, you don't need to have a very deep understanding of the sport to understand what is going on with human rights. But there's a new golf league that is coming out, and it's basically it's backed by Saudi Arabia and American players and European players are going and leaving America and they're going to play in this new Saudi golf league. Now, all of a sudden, you know, people are having a huge issue with this and American government and American sports commentators are saying, look at these American athletes. These guys are sellouts. They're, they're leaving America and going to another golf league. Basically, there's a lot of money in this new golf league. Obviously, it's backed by Saudi Arabia, who has a tremendous amount of assets. And what we're, what's, what's happening is, is we're seeing this as, as, as a prime example of cancel culture. And I highlighted this in another video earlier uh, last month when I said that, you know, basically the United States is trying to use cancel culture against China. And again, this is something that uh, even myself as a content creator, I've experienced this as well, is when you start talking about China, uh, people have a very negative perception. I should say people in North America or Westerners in general, they have a negative association with China. So someone like myself, someone that is a constant bridge builder between East and West, someone that is advocating for a stronger United States and China relationship. I mean, obviously, I, I get a lot of comments. I get a lot of emails. I get a lot of people you know, pushing back against the message that I'm preaching. And what I found really disturbing is, is that ESPN, uh, who again is a sports network, you know, they came out with an article highlighting the different NBA owners, National Basketball Association. And they basically saying, um, look at these NBA owners and their connections to China. And they highlighted, look at this NBA owner. He manufactures his products in China. Look at this NBA owner. He sells software. 30% of the revenues come from China. Look at this NBA owner. He owns eight restaurants in China. And the goal with that article was to basically make you think that these NBA owners are colluding with the Chinese government, that they are doing something illegal. I mean, somebody, please tell me, what's wrong with manufacturing your product in China? Obviously nothing. We've been doing that. I mean, and, I've, and this is one of my very first videos on YouTube when I had probably 3,000 subscribers. You know, if you look at the Dow 30, all of these top American companies all have tremendous exposure to China. We manufacture in China. And there's something that people need to understand. It was not China that, that forced American companies to come over. Nobody from China said, you must come to our country and manufacture your products. That is capitalism. That is America saying, we need to find the most efficient, 
the most cost efficient place on the planet to manufacture so that we can maximize our revenue potential. And that's why we went to China. That's why we opened up 50 years ago. That's why we started an economic relationship or diplomatic relationship with China. And that is something that we've been doing. We've been doing business with China and, and millions upon millions of Americans have become much richer because of it. Millions and millions of Chinese have become much richer with that. It's been a two way street. Both parties really um, you know, benefiting tremendously from this relationship. Now, the interesting thing is, is, you know, for example, uh, the Houston Rockets, obviously the number one uh, team in China, you know, NBA team in China, you know, because of Yao Ming, well, their owner uh, owns Landry's, which is a very big hospitality group. He owns Morton Steakhouses, very popular steakhouse in America. Anyways, there's eight Morton Steakhouses in China, and they basically tried to throw them under the bus. Why are you operating steakhouses in China? Uh, is there anything wrong with operating a restaurant in China? Is it is it wrong for an American businessman to be selling steaks to, to Chinese citizens? Of course not. But we have this cancel culture that's happening. Uh, we see it, and this is very big in North America. I mean, we see this with everything. Uh, you know, uh, you know. For example, uh, Will Smith comes out, slaps somebody across the face at the Oscars. His movies are now canceled. I mean, we saw Johnny Depp. You know, he went through this whole allegation litigation thing. You know, he was canceled. I mean, it. You know, you send out a tweet. You know, you have a risk of being canceled. I mean, this it's a very big cancel culture happening in here, and unfortunately, we're seeing that with with China. Uh, you know, anybody that anybody that's connected to China. And the interesting thing here is we're seeing this in the sports world now. And and and, and I find it very contradicting because a lot of people now are saying, um, how can these professional golfers? How can they go? and play in a golf league that is owned by Saudi Arabia. And the reality is, is that's our strategic ally. I, I think it would be very different, for example, if let's say North Korea opened a golf league or North Korea opened a sports league. You know, North Korea, for example, um, we, we don't have a diplomatic relationship with them. We don't have a close relationship. They're not somebody that is directly impacting our economy. They've been shut off to the world. And so that would be a very different scenario in my opinion. And so I think what we need to really look at is we really need to just look at uh, being consistent. And unfortunately, with the United States, uh, and this is what I really highlighted with that opening clip from Jimmy Carter, you know, Jimmy Carter says, if we look at our own track record, OK, we look at what the United States has done around the world. We are not in a position to accuse anybody. Now, that being said, what it also doesn't do, and I want to make sure that this is a point that I think many people do overlook, we can't use the thing. Well, just because the United States did it, that now justifies somebody else to do that. I think I think we're all on the same page here, and that is that we all stand for human rights. We understand that human rights is important around the world, no matter where you are. I mean, we want to see human rights in every country in the world, China included, United States included. And I think that it is up to every country to, to self-examine. Are you improving human rights? Are you doing a better job? And I think we can argue that there is you know, continuous human right abuses in many countries around the world, United States included. Um, you know, I mean, I've had many people of uh, color talk to me and say, well, you know, Cyrus, you know, I feel I, I feel segregated. I feel discriminated even in America, you know, that, you know, there's still black people being killed for their color of their skin. You know, that's a human rights abuse. Um, you know, we've seen I mean, we can even get down to the low to the level of, you know, safety. I mean, and this is something that if you see my recent videos, I'm, I'm very outspoken on, and that is, is gun violence in America. Uh, I mean, th this is something that is just heartbreaking for me as an American citizen, uh, seeing that literally my home country is the only country in the world that struggles with school shootings. There's not another country in the world that has this problem. And, you know, I, I contrast that with China. And this is something that I, that I often say, you know, I lived 10 years in China, as many of you know. And that was a tremendous amount of freedom that I had in China, uh, knowing that every day I could walk out on the streets. Uh, China is a very safe society. Uh, you know, safety is guaranteed in China for citizens. That's something that Chinese citizens never have to worry about is going out on the streets. Uh, obviously, there's no gun violence in China. Uh, you don't have to you know, worry about you can go out at one o'clock in the morning, two, three o'clock in the morning in Shanghai. Uh, Beijing, wherever you want to go, anywhere in China, you can walk out. You're never going to, you know, have any violence uh, done against you. That's that's a freedom. I mean, that's a that's a human right, in my opinion. I think that's a very good thing that China is doing. We don't have that in America. Uh, you know, I mean, we sit, look at uh, the country that I'm currently in right now, Canada. 
I mean, we had a horrible thing that was un unveiled last year. And that was the fact that we had school, we had native, native, we call them first Nations. So this would be the, you know, the Indians or the, you know, the, the first, the native, native Americans, as we would say in America and China and Canada is called first nations. Uh, these are the aboriginals that lived here first. First nations, children were massacred, you know, here in Canada, and they were buried in the, the basements of these churches. Uh, we found a, a huge, uh, all these unmarked graves here in British Columbia, the very province that I'm living in. And this was an absolute disaster for Canada. I mean, this was a really sad day for Canada. Uh, they actually had to make a new national holiday in Canada last year. Uh, we had, you know, all of these unmarked graves found. And again, you know, that's the good thing with Canada is, as I would say that, you know, we have, uh, you know, obviously that was in the past, you know, this was probably about 150 years ago. So they have, you know, corrected that, not 150, Canada is only 150 years ago, but nonetheless, it was a long time ago. And the good thing is, is that Canada has come out, they have said, look, we made mistakes in the past, we need to do a better job. And again, my main point with this is that we all need to, you know, improve, we all need to improve on human rights, and we all need to, uh, you know, hold each other accountable, I would say. But the big thing is, is I think what we're really struggling is, is when we look at the United States, we see it's very hard for countries around the world to kind of take the United States seriously, given our track record. And that's a big thing that I want to do. I'm going to bring up an article here and I'm going to bring up an article and then I'm going to um, I'm, and then I'm going to go back to these comments because we have a few super chats come in. We've had a few. Um, you know, comments here that I'm going to go through. And I'm going to go back to Saudi Arabia and the U.S. and talking about the United States dollar and how this has really impacted the, our world right now. And it's basically, here's a great article uh, that I found, and it is called, I'm just going to read it for you guys. And it says, the United States dollar for all intents and purposes is backed by oil. It has been that way, and it's been that way by design since the 1970s when the United States worked with OPEC to ensure a steady flow of oil to this country. In exchange for the oil producing countries only accepting United States dollars for oil, the United States would support regimes like Saudi Arabia. This tied the dollar to oil, giving it a de facto commodity backing and keeping it as the de facto currency. And it's as close to a world currency as we have seen. Now, dollars are um, accepted everywhere on the planet. We know that. And this is something that is also another interesting thing. This is something that I also highlighted here is that there's been a lot of pushback and this is, you know, against the United States dollar. Many people, you know, many nations around the world feel that the United States does unfortunately weaponize the U.S. dollar. Uh, you know, we've seen this, for example, well, you know, with Russia, you know, that we, you know, as soon as we get into a conflict with you, we can cut off your dollar. And as soon as we cut off that dollar, that makes trading very, very difficult for you. Uh, this is why, you know, Vladimir Putin immediately said you need to now start paying for our oil and gas, you're going to have to pay in ruble because we want to strengthen our local currency here. And But we've seen that. We've seen, we you know, for example, I mean, a great example is I'm originally from Florida. 90 miles away is Cuba. We have sanctioned them. We have cut them off. Uh, you know, we have basically, um, you know, we've been holding an embargo over Cuba for over 60 years simply because we don't believe with their government. And this is another trend that we see with the United States is when, when we don't, agree with your type of government, you know, we don't want to do business with you. We can just sanction you and cut you off to the U.S. dollar, which is the de facto uh, world currency. Now, this dollar first policy has been the cornerstone of American foreign policy since Vietnam. It was the primary thrust behind the decision to invade Iraq and replace Saddam Hussein. The war in Iraq had nothing to do with establishing democracy um, or overthrowing a dictator. It had nothing to do with freedom nor with weapons of mass destruction. We simply invaded Iraq and killed Saddam Hussein because he wanted his oil exports to be paid in euros. And that, of course, was the difference there. You know, when he mentioned that, that was enough. The United States came in and overthrew him. And, and again, this is something that we see. Again, it's, it's very critical. I think when we see, you know, Vladimir Putin invading a sovereign nation as Ukraine, um, yes, we can all recognize that that is, uh, you know, I mean, even China has said, you know, we, we support Ukraine. Support, Ukraine is a sovereign nation. Invading a sovereign nation is wrong. Uh, but unfortunately, the United States has done that many times. You know, that, that is our track record. That's what we do. And it is a very unfortunate thing. Um, let's see. Uh, in 2001, 
Uh, Venezuela ambassador to Russia mentioned that Venezuela wanted to switch to euro for all of Venezuela oil sales. Oil sales. It took less than 12 months for the CIA to assist on a coup attempt against the Venezuelan government. Uh, we've even seen that now recently. Joe Biden, he hosted the Summit of Americas. Uh, this was a big summit for all of the nations in the Americas. That's North America and South America. And of course, certain countries were not invited. Uh, quite ironic for the United States. Uh, they said, this is a summit for every country in the Americas. But by the way, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba, you guys aren't invited because we don't like your government. And that caused a big outrage. I'm actually going to highlight this in an upcoming video. Uh, but this caused a big outrage. And actually, the Mexican president, he said, we need to put these politics aside. If we're going to have a summit of the Americas, it's absolutely vital that all countries are present at the table because we're talking about huge issues here. We're talking about climate change. We're talking about financial security. Uh, obviously, we have a huge recession that's going on, massive recession going on across the world as we see the fallouts of you know, COVID-19 and you know, just basically what's been happening these last two years with this pandemic. And also we have migration. There's, there's a lot of you know, huge problems that need to be addressed around the world, especially in the Americas, but the U.S. government was playing politics. You know, you guys can come to my meeting. You guys can't. Very immature. And a lot of analysts said this was even a diplomatic own goal from the United States, just not recognizing the importance of bringing everybody together and, and coming to the table. Again, we're going to have different governments. We're going to have different opinions on things. Um, but this is something this is something that I wanted to highlight is basically this huge this huge contradiction that we have, you know, on one sense. You know, we want to say nobody should be doing business with Saudi Arabia. It's 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 illegal or it's it's wrong for these golfers to be going to Saudi Arabia. But at the same standpoint, we've been in bed with Saudi Arabia since 1945, and our entire economy depends on Saudi oil. Uh, again, they're a strategic partner. We've been close with Saudi Arabia, and so I really think what we need to do is we need to. The United States has to set a better example for human rights, and and until we do that. I just don't think that we can really lecture other countries around the world. Uh, I mean, it's, and, and again, it's, it's kind of one of those things that you learn at school. When you point your finger at somebody, that means you have, you know, three more fingers pointing back at you. That's the thing that we learned, you know, in, in school here. Uh, let's take a break. I can sometimes go off on a tangent here, uh, but let's go ahead. I know we had some super chats come in. I want to thank you guys. We have uh, close to 600 people here in the stream this morning, which is always nice because, you know, we've taken a long time from streaming over three months since our last stream. And I'm going to take some time here. Um, Trevor Trevor Norman, I uh, appreciate your support, my friend. You're always here on the streams. It's been a, been a while since I've seen you. Uh, China's human rights are to live free of wars and not in poverty. Uh, that is true. I mean, we know that with, uh, there's a couple of things that I've highlighted. You know, we, we see China and its ability to not be involved in international conflicts. Uh, it, it's quite ironic to me as well. That you know, we hear this message being preached from America and Western countries is that China is this huge military threat. You know, we 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 worry about the fact that China is going to be building a military presence. The interesting thing is, is that even General Miley, who is the top United States general of, of the military, he said China building a larger military does not necessarily mean that that's a threat. That's what a superpower does. Okay. If you are like China, you have risen from, again, 50 years ago, China was one of the top 10 poorest countries in the world. Now they are one of the richest. You know, within the next five years, they will overtake the United States as the number one economy in the world. When you're in that position, you're going to, you're a superpower and superpowers are going to improve their military capabilities. Again, how can the United States question what China is doing militarily when we have over 800 military bases around the world? Uh, I mean, even in the fact, I mean, look at, I think we have over 150 military bases in Japan alone. Uh, I think almost 200 over, if you include Korea in that. So we have over 200 U.S. military bases in Japan and Korea alone. Obviously, all of those were, are within a very close vicinity of China. So it, it's kind of ironic when, you know, for example, China has a military base in Djibouti. And we're saying, oh, look at China. They're expanding their military presence. Well, the reason why they're in Djibouti is basically for piracy, right? We know that those coasts, the coast off of the African East Coast, there's a lot of piracy that's going on. 
uh, you know, China has done that because China exports products all over the world. They have cargo ships in the waters and every ocean around the world. There's Chinese cargo ships. That's a big reason for that. As far as, um, you know, human rights and, um, you know, not living in poverty in China, we know that China has spent a lot of money, a lot of time. It's been a huge goal of the Chinese government to improve, um, you know, the the poverty, you know, that's happening, you know, poverty alleviation. And I think I want to be clear on this. It's absolute poverty that China has eliminated. There's still obviously many poor people in China. Uh, it's going to be a continuous goal. Uh, but we see that around the world as well. I mean, I'm looking back at my home country. I'm looking here in Canada as well. I mean, this pandemic has really exasperated the divide between the upper and the lower class. Uh, I mean, there are so many people that are struggling because inflation is through the roof. Uh, I mean, it's it's very difficult. I mean, I I went, I mean, I'll give you an example. I was in Richmond, British Columbia yesterday. I went for some Vietnamese noodles yesterday. I had the beef pho, 25 Canadian dollars for a bowl of beef pho. I mean, that's insane. I mean, that's, that, that, I mean, that, that is a, such a high cost, but I mean, I'm thinking, I mean, the, the minimum wage here is around 15, $16 an hour. Uh, I mean, that's, I mean, you almost, if you're, if you're working on minimum wage, it's almost going to take you, you know, an hour and a half of work just to get your lunch for the day. Now, granted, there's cheaper options, but I'm just wanting to, let's just give you an example. That meal a year ago in Canada would have cost you less than 15. So this is how prices are going up. You go to the uh, grocery store right now, a two pack of chicken breasts, you know, two boneless, skinless chicken breasts is going to cost you around 16 Canadian dollars. We've seen a tremendous amount of increase. Uh, gas is almost eight dollars a gallon here. I mean, imagine if you are commuting to your job here. I mean, it's it's there's it's a huge, huge, huge stretch on uh, the lower class. You know, trying to just survive. I mean, and this is something that this is something all countries are going to uh, have to deal with. I, I did see a report from China that uh, unemployment is uh, really high in the eighteen to twenty four year old. I think it was as high as eighteen percent in a new report, uh, which is astronomically high for China. In addition, you know, uh, many, many, uh, the, the Gaokao, which is the university entrance exam, uh, that just completed in China. There's going to be millions of new graduates that are coming out. So China's not without its problems. China's not without its difficulties. It's going to be difficult for China as well, uh, you know, going forward and, and trying to provide these jobs. So this is something that all of us are, are dealing with right now, uh, every country around the world. But I want to address Trevor. Thank you for that support on that super chat. And thank you for uh, that uh, comment there. Uh, we've got another one, I think, down here from Dips. Uh, China has a growing middle class and stable society compared to the U.S., which now has a declining society and a falling middle class. No matter how much the U.S. tries, it won't be able to stop China's rise to the top. Um, that's a good point. I mean, that's a, thank you for the uh, super chat there, Dips. Uh, China does have a growing middle class. Uh, that is, again, that's been the continuous theme. Um, I, I will say, though, that uh, there's going to be some difficulties for China. Um, I'm, I'm always, as you know, guys, I'm very fair. I'm very balanced. I'm not here to say, oh, China, you know, U.S. is declining. You know, it's done. China's the best ever. You know, we're all of us are in this together. Uh, we're we are going towards a world recession right now. Uh, we've seen the effects of the locks down in Shanghai uh, has has dis, has um, you know completely disrupted global supply chains. Um, you know, the situation in Shanghai has has really been very difficult for many small to medium sized businesses that just simply don't have the capital to survive. So this is going to be a, a big challenge for China as well. I think it's I think. Um, but generally speaking, um, you know, I, I still think what what's what we're seeing, though, is that I think there's more affordability in China. You know, so when you look at, um, you know, one of the things, for example, when I told when I told people. Uh, in America, I said, you know, if you were if you're an average worker in China, so let's say earning three, four thousand renminbi a month, um, you know, that's a, a you know, and it might be more higher now because of uh, you know rising costs and everything, and even hiring factory workers, you know, has become more expensive in China over the years. Uh, but let's just say you earn you know four thousand renminbi a month. China is still affordable in that sense that you know you can still save and you can live a modest lifestyle. But like I mentioned in these examples here in Canada. You know, in North America, our cost of living is so high. Uh, owning a car is extremely high here. The insurance, the the uh, gasoline, the taxes is just astronomical. Uh, rent is through the roof. So, kind of as a percentage wise, I think China is doing really good. You know, keeping things at a more affordable level here. I, I know I've talked to many, I've spoken to many expats in China who have said that. 
you know, so just being able to, you know, being able to afford the basic things in life, it is, it is a little bit better in China in that regard. Um, and uh, let's keep, uh, let's keep going on through some of these comments here. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Alex from Reporterify Media. Uh, I think many of you guys probably follow his channel. I want to thank Alex for, uh, for being here. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, make sure you check out his channel. He's obviously the number one drone uh, producer of content in China. He does some amazing drone videos every week. And there's, I think he's launching a new video right after this live stream. Um, <clears throat> and let's see. Uh, yeah, China doesn't bomb and attack other countries from G. Shepard. That is true. Here's a one from Cheda, uh, a question here. Hi, Cyrus. How do you think the U.S. will behave towards African countries going forward as China becomes more of a pure competitor? I think what we've seen... You know, China is going to continue to develop more in Africa. And I think what we're going to see is with the United States is, is they simply, the U.S. is spread too thin right now. You know, we, I mean, one of the things that that I think is just absolutely mind-blowing is that we've spent, we sent $40 billion to Ukraine, um, you know, to to support Ukraine. And and that's, and that that really angered a lot of American citizens because quite simply, I mean, we, we, we can't afford that. Uh, we can't afford to spend forty billion dollars, you know, to Ukraine. And there's so many things that that money could have done inside of America. And again, this is where I've highlighted in recent videos. I guys I encourage you guys to go back to my recent videos where I, I have a picture of, uh, you know, I talk about the Solomon Islands. I talk about uh, other Asia Pacific countries choosing to work with China. Uh, this was a fascinating story that I highlighted in a article. Is that Joe Biden recently went to Asia? And he said, "You know, what we're going to do. We're, we want to. We want to. We want to stay committed to the region. And and for the Asian countries, that's a group of ten nations in Asia Pacific. We're going to pledge 150 million dollars to basically let you know that America is here and that we want to be here and support you. Now, 150 million dollars split the ten split amongst ten countries. Obviously, simple math there, 15 million apiece." That's basically nothing. <laughs> I mean, the United States, you're coming to the table offering just pennies on the dollar of what China's doing. China came and said, we're going to offer you $1.5 billion. Uh, so it's, I mean, you can't compare the two offerings there. But again, we can just see where America's priorities are. Uh, China is coming through it. And again, there's a tangible result there. I, I, I highlighted in that video, in another video where I said, you know, African leaders, they're, they're quite keen to work with China because, again, China comes in and you're going to get a tangible asset. You know, when China comes into your country, you know, at the bare minimum, you're going to get something that's going to produce some results here. You're going to get a, a railway, a port, an airport, something like that. Uh, you know, Alex from Reportify Media, he went to Maldives. He has a whole uh, travel section uh, when he went to the Maldives. Well, China completely renovated that airport. I think China owns the airport in the Maldives, uh, but they basically built them a brand new airport because the Maldives is a it's a tourist destination, right? 90% of their economy is based on tourism, internationals flying in and going to the Maldives. And the key thing is, is that they didn't have a good airport. So all of a sudden, you know, if you're the Maldives, it makes sense. China's coming in and it's saying, look, I want to build you an airport. Now, many people are going to say, well, what about China? Aren't they going to own that airport? Aren't you worried about China, you know, may maybe potentially, you know, owning that very piece, of, that very important piece of infrastructure? If I'm the Maldives prime minister, I have no problem sharing that profit with China or even allowing China to own it outright and take all the profit from it. Because number one, what you need in your, if you don't have the money to build a world-class airport, but yet you have China coming in and building a world-class airport, what happens when you have a world-class airport? If you can double the size of your airport, you have a world-class airport, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to be able to accept more tourists. And that's exactly what China did. As soon as they built that airport and knowing that it's a Chinese investment, well, obviously that's going to give you the green light from China. There's more flights coming in from China. More and more Chinese tourists are going to Maldives. As a result, it's it's a win-win for the country of the Maldives because number one, you now have a functional world-class airport that's going to be going to be able to handle double the amount of tourists. And now you're getting double the amount of tourists, but you're also getting tourists from the number one tourism country in the world, which is China. So it just makes sense. And again, when you're that country that, again, there's, there's no exports from coming from the Maldives. You're not buying products made in the Maldives. They sell 
beachfront vacations. That's their export to the world. And, and they do that by inviting people to come in and, and spend time with them there. So again, I think as we look at, um, you know, African countries, they're wanting to deal business with the Chinese because they're going to get those tangible assets. Now, I, I, re- I have an interesting analogy for this. The United States, what we do is we come in and we've done a lot of aid to Africa. Uh, I remember back in the 1990s, remember uh, there was a big thing for uh, as AIDS was going through Africa. You know, we had Michael Jackson and all of these top performers. You know, they all sang this song, We Are the World. And it was basically a, um, a charity to raise money for, 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 for Africa. And it was awesome. I mean, we raised tens of millions of dollars. We donated money to Africa for, you know, whether it be vaccines or medical treatment. And all of that is very good. I'm never going to say that that's not good. But it's, it's akin to this analogy. If you, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for the day. If you teach a man to fish, you can feed him for a lifetime. Now, the United States coming in and donating supplies and medical support, food, water, all of these things are important, right? Because they need it. They simply need that support. But also what's important is, is if you have new food and supplies and medical, it just gets you by for a little bit. It improves your day or your week or your medical condition. But what is the pathway for Africans to actually having a better life? It is going to be, you know, trade. That's that's what they need to do. It's going to be building a port. It's going to be building them a better road, better airport, you know, helping them involve in trade. Uh, I mean, I've seen, I, I saw, uh, you know, a clip on Twitter probably almost two years ago now where these African children were learning Chinese. And the person that shared that on Twitter wrote a very negative point of this. He said, look at these poor African children being forced by Chinese to learn Mandarin inside of Africa. I mean, let's be honest. Mandarin's the most spoken language in the world. I've studied Mandarin for many years. I want my children to speak Mandarin. I mean, if we go, if you're here in Canada or America, most of the affluent uh, people in society, they, they make sure that their kids are going to private tutors and learning Mandarin. Why? Because we know that speaking Chinese is, a, is going to be a very important asset for people moving forward. So it's, it's quite an interesting, um, an interesting, you know, kind of double standard there, I would say. Uh, how many products sell on Amazon that are not made in China? As you know, absolutely. We, we trust on that. I mean, that's something that I think we, we, you know, we can't live this North American lifestyle without China. Very important. Um, got a, a, a super chat from Andy Tai. Andy, if you're still here, um, thank you so much for the Bravo super chat. I appreciate you being here. Guys, we've just passed over 830 people in the stream here. I want to thank you guys. Thank you all for spending some time with me the, today as I'm getting back in the game on my live stream. And we're talking about something that is so important here. And that is um, that is human rights. That is human rights. Uh, we're talking about China and we're talking about America. And uh, and here's a good question uh, from here's a good point from Woodland. Did Biden call that country a pariah? Yes. And that is what's really important here. This is a big thing that's happening uh, with Joe Biden. Joe Biden called Saudi Arabia a pariah state. And then, you know, he had to go back and basically beg Saudi Arabia for more oil as you know we started boycotting Russia. So it was a huge, you know, loss of face, you know, for the United States. And, and again, it's, it's just just be consistent with what you with what we do, you know, how we go about our business. You know, we've had a close relationship with Saudi Arabia. I know the United States, we're not going to get away from oil. We're not going to get away from dealing with the Saudis. That is how our economy has been since the early seventies. You know, that's, that's what we do. So let's, let's just recognize that and, and own that, but you just stop with the double standards, right? We can't say we're going to do business with Saudi Arabia. We're going to base the U S dollar on oil. We're going to have make sure that everybody just trades the oil in the U.S. dollar. But by the way, you know we're we're, we're going to cancel these guys because they want to do business with Saudi Arabia. It doesn't it, it doesn't work that way. You can't have both. Um, China owns the U.S. From Kyle Burton, I think the U.S. is uh, has a very close relationship with China. I mean, again, that's something that I try to highlight on this stream is just the fact that you get, we have to recognize the United States and China are absolutely tied together. This is another video that I highlighted why the United States can truly never really sanction China. The United States and China both need each other. And it's a two-way street here because the because China owns a tremendous amount of uh, United States currency, right? We have the, uh, the uh, uh, what is it? The currency bonds, the, uh, d- the bonds from uh, the United States government. China owns 
all of these bonds and they, they can't just dump them. A lot of people say China should just dump these treasury bonds that, that they have bought in America. Well, there's you can't just dump billions of dollars of treasury bonds. Number one, no one can take that amount of money. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not billions, it's trillions. It's I think it's $1.2 trillion worth of treasury bonds. Uh, no other bank or country can absorb that amount of capital. Uh, so it's impossible to just dump that. So China China needs a strong U.S., right? That's why I always say China needs both because, again, China's selling the products to the U.S. Uh, we want that strategic relationship. And as we know, I mean, China, you know, in the United States, we absolutely depend on, on that. Um, here's another question. Um, Vancouver in Canada has been nicknamed the anti-Asian hate capital, crime capital of North America, surpassing even many U.S. cities in terms of anti-Asian hate. Uh, that is true. I've lived in Vancouver for the last five years. I have seen, um, I have, I have witnessed that even in my local neighborhood here. I've seen Asian hate crime. Um, I've seen, I've seen actually firsthand, you know, Chinese people being attacked for speaking Chinese uh, here in Vancouver, and I've stood up for them. You know, I mean, there's obviously. No problem speaking Chinese. I mean, obviously, if I'm speaking Chinese with somebody else, uh, it's a lot of just. Um, I mean, unfortunately, that's just the world that we live in today, right? I mean, everything. I get it. I, I understand. I mean, I I have a lot of insight that many people don't. Having lived in China, I have a different perspective. But I mean, if you're just the typical North American that has never left your country, I mean, you know, you only listen to mainstream media. Of course, you're going to have a negative impression of China. That's all you've been taught. And that's, again, why I try to spend a lot of time here just trying to find more balance here, right? We're trying to find balance. We're trying to make sure that, you know, the world can come together. And um, and that is, uh, that's that's the goal of this. Um, let's see. Let's see some other, uh, other great comments that we have here. Woodlands, human rights is an empty slogan. Yeah, unfortunately, I think that Human rights has been used by too long, you know, just to, I'm going to give you guys a really interesting example here. I'm going to go a little political here. Um, there's something that is really interesting that's happening in America right now. And that is Joe Biden. A few weeks ago, he mentioned, uh, you know, the Joe Biden and the Democratic government. There's a very new trend that is happening right now is that they're really trying to uh, push uh, for example, transgender. There's a transgender agenda that is going on in the United States government. And again, you know, I'm not against trans people or anything, but what they basically, what Joe Biden has said is that we need to push this in every school system. And there has been some schools that have pushed back on this transgender agenda. Joe Biden said, if you do not accept this transgender agenda, we will there cut your school lunches. And this is something that is happening in America. This is this actually blows my mind that the United States president could threaten cutting the federal uh, federal school program for lunches. OK, and this is something that we you know we talk about in America. I mean, this is something that many people know. There are millions of children in America that they're that they live in poverty and their only meal of the day comes at school. They're absolutely dependent on that school lunch to get their food because they don't have breakfast in the morning. Dinner is basically hit or miss. They might get dinner if they get it because they're living in poverty. And this is um, this is this is just mind blowing to me that, uh, that the United States president would threaten American citizens, you know, and take away their school lunches if they don't agree with some agenda. And, and I just don't appreciate that. I think we can have an open discussion on transgender and rights and things like that. But how could we talk about something like a basic human right of eating? You know, like like when we talk about human rights, the most important things are, you know, shelter, uh, safety, um, you know, food, access to, you know, clean, reliable water, things like that. I mean, these are things that are the ba this is the basic minimum, right? We have that hierarchy of needs, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This is the bottom need, right? You need food, shelter, things like that. That has to be stable here. And again, I, I really, really. I just don't like to see that from the United States. Um, and again, it's, it's just really, really, really sad here. Let's let's go to some of these questions here. Um, I thought I saw it. Uh, PL Fong, Cyrus, uh, you are delusional. Yes, U.S. and China have a relationship with the U.S. imposed sanctions and high tariffs on China. That is true. Uh, that is true. But the interesting thing about that is, is that that basically has backfired on the U.S. and that has caused... The, 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 the problem with that is, is that the person that loses with that is the end consumer. 
You know, when we have put high tariffs on our own goods, who are you, you know, who's who's going to be paying the brunt of that? It's the, it's the U.S. consumer. I mean, we saw that, for example, uh, very early when Donald Trump launched his trade war against against China. Uh, basically, one of the target markets that was was being targeted was actually shoe wear. So we saw shoes, obviously, majority of shoes are being produced in China. And we saw basically they had a, almost 200 shoe companies, including Nike and Under Armour. They all came together and they basically went to the White House to talk to Donald Trump and said, look, if you do not repeal these tariffs, we are going to have to pass these costs on to the U.S. consumer. That tariff is approximately 25 percent. So if you have a hundred dollar pair of, of, of shoes, of sneakers, you know, that's now going to cost one hundred and twenty five dollars. Well, Nike and Under Armour and other shoe companies aren't going to take that hit. They're not going to say, yeah, let me just I'm going to just take that twenty five dollar tariff. Of course not. They're going to pass that on to the consumer. Your hundred dollar shoes are now going to cost one hundred and twenty five dollars, which you know, ultimately, who's the loser there? It's the U.S. consumer there. So, you know, and we've already seen that. We've already seen this is something I think that uh, Joe Biden is going to be talking with President Xi uh, very soon. You know, they, they did have a a teleconference call. I think it was probably back in uh, October last year, I'm going to say. But I believe that uh, Joe Biden has hinted that he is going to have another round of communication with Xi Jinping. I think that's a positive thing. Anytime you have the leaders of the two most powerful countries in the world talking with each other, discussing, I think that this is really important. In fact, I think this has actually been a, a, a big reason why the U.S. and China relationship is at its worst point in the last 50 years is unfortunately the two leaders haven't been able to meet. You know, Xi Jinping has not been able to leave China because of the pandemic. Uh, Joe Biden has not gone to China uh, or Donald Trump for that matter. So I would love to see an in-person meeting. I think that these teleconference calls are good, but I, I don't think anything can replace that in-person meeting. I would love to see Joe Biden personally travel to Beijing to meet with Xi Jinping. Um, I think it would be a great thing for these two nations to have that face-to-face -face discussion. And I think that, uh, but one of those things that are in talks is that that uh, Joe Biden is going to be now um, taking back even more tariffs on China. Because again, with the state of the United States economy, we can see what the Federal Reserve is doing. They're raking interest rates up. They're trying to you know, curb inflation. They're going to probably send the United States economy into a recession to somehow tame recession, uh, you know, to, to, to tame inflation rather. And this is something that we need to see with, with the U.S., right? I mean, we need to have a better trading relationship with China. For me, it comes down to, you know, it comes down to trade. That is just so important. And that is what, uh, you know, it, that's how we basically, um, excuse me, that's how we improve people's economic stability, right? Uh, Mark Young, a uh, great supporter of the channel. Mark, good to see you here today, buddy. Um, United States, Canada, and China must each set better examples of human rights. I agree. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, uh, there was the UN visit to, to Xinjiang recently. This has been kind of a controversial thing. Um, a lot of people always ask me to make videos on Xinjiang, to share my thoughts about Xinjiang. Uh, first of all, I do want to say, I do think it's good that the United Nations did send a representative to China. I think it's good that the that, that China opened up and have somebody come, come and visit Xinjiang. Now, I know that there's a lot of criticism there. A lot of people said, well, this UN, um, you know, the UN uh, appointee, the, basically the lady that went to Xinjiang to visit, you know, she only got to see what China wanted her to see. She only got to see certain parts of it. She didn't get to see everything. Well, it's certainly a step in the right direction. And the other thing is, is that I think that, you know, for China, unfortunately, people are still going to have these allegations against China. I, I don't know enough about Xinjiang. I've never personally visited Xinjiang. Um, I don't I don't know enough about the region. I, I think there's a lot of interesting things. Uh, what I have done is I've, I've interviewed several people on my channel that have spent time in the region. And I've always been interested to hear, you know, what was your experiences like in Xinjiang when you travel to Kashgar and Urumqi? You know, what was the scene there? You know, do, you know, were you able to hear the Uyghur language being spoken? Were you able to visit mosques? Were you able to, you know, see how daily life is being, you know, is, is being, you know, what was your interpretation of daily life there? Um, I think that, you know, Xinjiang is a very vast province. Uh, we know that there's been a lot of problems there over the years. And I think it's something that, you know, we need to continue to, you know, observe. And we need to make sure that, um, you know, that, 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 that is that 
that were again that were holding everybody accountable. The interesting thing though is that here in North America, what we always often hear is we're, we're like, well, China has these concentration camps in Xinjiang. China has these people being executed there. You know, those are false statements. And again, that's where people just don't do enough research. They don't know because that's we just hear the word concentration camp, which is the wrong terminology. We immediately think Adolf Hitler. We think the Jewish concentration camps. We think of people being exterminated. You know, we've seen the population in Xinjiang be growing. I think you can make an argument that is there a cultural genocide going there? I don't know. You know, but that's why I say. So if you travel there, what's it like? You know, are people being punished for speaking the Uyghur language? Not from what I've been able to see, not from the people that I've interviewed. I know that, uh, for example, you know, when you travel to Tibet, the Tibetan language is being taught in the schools. I've spoken with people from Tibet. You know, the Tibetan language is being embraced. It's on the back of the currency. It's, it, you know, if you are, you know, there's 300 different dialects around China. I think that, uh, and I made a video about this earlier as well, you know, is the need for the importance and the need for a dominant language in China. We, do, we can't really comprehend that when you come from North America, right? When you are born in the United States or Canada, you can speak English and you can travel anywhere in your country and you will have no problem. We, it's very different in China, right? You ever spend time in Shanghai, you'll know the local Shanghainese people, very passionate about speaking Shanghainese. When another Shanghainese person meets another Shanghainese person, they're obviously going to speak in Shanghainese. And, you know, that dialects are so strong around China. You can travel 30 minutes west into Suzhou, they're going to speak a different dialect. Um, obviously, you know, you go down to the southern China, many people very passionate about speaking Cantonese. Uh, you know, and, and so again, these dialects are not being suppressed, but you do see that, for example, uh, you know, not, not as many people are speaking, the new generations of Shanghainese are not speaking uh, Shanghainese as much. Why? Well, because Mandarin's become more important, you know, because a lot of immigrants are coming into Shanghai. A lot of people from other cities are coming into Shanghai. So it's, it's important to understand all of these dynamics and how diversified, you know, China really is. Um, Frederick Ishan, Cyrus, considering what's motivating the U.S. and its foreign policy with China, do you ever think there'll be a Detente with China. You know, I think what we're going to see is we're going to continue to see uh, ramped up tensions, uh, you know, between the U.S. and China. I think both of both the United States and China want to have a dominant military presence or, or a presence, I should say, not military. They want both of them want to have a dominant presence in Asia. Um, the interesting thing is, is that the United States, when they go to Asia, they primarily come in a military way. Right. We have hundreds of bases in the United in, in Asia. When I mentioned earlier in the stream, when Joe Biden, when he went to Asia recently on his trip, part of his hundred and fifty million dollar pre pledge to the Asian region, he said, you know what we're going to do? Forty percent of that budget, we're going to actually spend on sending more United States military vessels to the region. Now, in the U.S. mind, what they want to do is they want to contain China. They want to basically say. We're going to have U.S. patrol ships patrolling this region to basically make sure that everybody knows the United States is here and that we want to have a presence here. Now, the United States, now China, on the flip side, they're also going to have their military vessels going around. And again, you can make the argument, well, China's China is obviously in Asia. You know, obviously, it's going to have a very big impact there. Obviously, it has a lot of trade. You know, for example, the Philippines, for example, very big trade partner. Uh, you know, China, Philippines, very close. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see because I think both countries, China and the U.S., are going to want to have more of a presence in Asia uh, moving forward. Obviously, China is in Asia, so they're going to have the dominant presence, but you're going to see more con uh, more tension over that, unfortunately, uh, moving forward. I think, um, yeah, uh, here is another comment. Cyrus, U.S. is a nation that has armies all over the planet. It is an empire. It is true. I mean, there's no doubt about that. And, and that's something that it's really, it's really difficult for me to see, you know, for example, um, I mean, I, again, it baffles my mind when we have uh, these school shootings in America. Uh, I mean, we have the biggest, the baddest, the most proudest military in the world. Everybody in America loves the U.S. military. And, and the reason for that is, is that we are, we are taught from a very young age. Um, I'm going to call it as it is. We're taught a lie. We're taught that freedom isn't free. The reason why you, Cyrus, as an American citizen, have freedom is because we have troops around the world fighting for your freedom. That's not true. We, our troops are not around the world fighting for our freedom. They're fighting for other things like oil, like, you know, you know, U.S. dollar dominance. 
Um, is, you know, there's many countries in the world that have freedom. Uh, again, Canada. Yeah, yeah, I'm in Canada right now. We have just as much freedom in Canada as you have in America, uh, Germany, Australia, Japan, everywhere. I mean, you you can you can make the argument that there's a ton of countries that have freedom. But in America, we have this interesting thing. We tend to think that we're the only country in the world that has freedom. And that is something that, you know, that's why we've kind of been brainwashed that, you know, what you need to do, you need to support your troops, support your troops, you know, going around the world and fighting all these different wars. Um, that is that, you know, I really would like to see the U.S. government spending more money, more time on our own country and prioritizing the needs of United States citizens. Again, I mentioned, uh, I mean, for example, if, you know, the gun thing is really difficult. I don't think that the gun problem will ever get solved in America. It's just, it's not going to happen uh, because, again, everybody wants that freedom. And so if we can't have that, if, if, we just if we just accept that, okay, well, you know what? Why don't we take all of our, instead of having 800 military bases around the world for no really reason, why don't we start sending some of our military and putting them at every school in America? I mean, honestly, like if we're not going to solve the gun problem, we need to think of another solution. I mean, it makes complete sense to me to have more strict gun laws. I'm 100% for gun control in America and for better gun control. But we're not. if we can't do that, then let's go for the next best solution. The next best solution is why don't we just go ahead and, you know, take this awesome military that we have and why don't we uh, get our troops defending our schools? It's, it's, it's ridiculous. It sounds ridiculous. I mean, this is where people, I think, in other countries, uh, and again, I'm not just talking China, I'm talking even Europeans, even Canadians. Canadians, I mean, they scratch their head every time there's a school shooting in America and they just are like, what's going on, guys? Like, why can't you just live in a civil society with with decent gun laws? Um, and, you know, but so but again, I mean, we're talking about human rights. Uh, I mean, I think it'd be a, a great human right for for American citizens to be able to send their children to school and not have to worry about them being gunned down. You know, that's a that's a human right violation, in my opinion. When you have the president saying, if you don't agree with this policy, we're going to take away your school lunch. Food is a human right. So again, all of us, we really need to make sure that I agree with go, going back to the beginning of the stream and that and that clip that I shared from Jimmy Carter. I think that we all need to hold each other accountable. I don't think that there's anything wrong with questioning somebody else's human right abuses. But if you're not doing anything to improve your own human rights, what's the point then? You know, then you're just virtual signaling. You know, you're virtue signaling and that's not going to get anywhere. Um interesting uh I, I know I'm, I'm very passionate about the gun control now guys we're over 900 people here on the stream uh so exciting i know it's, it's been a while since i've been on the live stream uh this is something that i want to do more of in the future um i i'm you know we're coming up to the end of the stream we've been going for over an hour now and what i want to do now is let's go ahead and send in your final questions i want to kind of cap it right at an hour here that way people that go through the playback you know can have a nice stream to look at um so please tell me um any other questions that you have, please send them in right now. Or we're going to answer that. And I'm also going to tell you guys some personal news on my level. Um, my family and I, we're actually getting ready to, uh, we're going to be uh, moving houses. We're going to be relocating. So kind of my personal life's a little bit busy now. We're leaving in 27 days. We're going to be moving from Vancouver, uh, relocating to a new city. I'm quite excited for this new start. And what I really want to do is in the future i'm hoping to actually have a de facto studio i'm actually in my um i'm in my office right now uh, i've got this little screen set up behind me but what i'd like to do is you know i'd like to have a regular weekly show that i'm going to you know start producing but i'm going to probably kind of launch that maybe at the end of summer you know once i get things a little bit more controlled here and uh you know i do have a lot of things that are uh coming up on uh, what city am I moving to? I'm going to keep it uh, discreet for right now. Um, I'm going to be moving somewhere exciting uh, for a couple of reasons. I, I'm going to just kind of, um, uh, you know, keep that to myself at the moment. But I've got a lot of kind of got a lot of things on the plate at the moment here. But let's go ahead and answer these last questions here. And I think I had a super chat come in here. Um, here we go. A sword fighter. Thank you for the super chat. How do you think? Uh, how do you think will the relations between China and the EU develop? I live in Europe, and I know that human rights are a big concern for policymaking. Um, I think that you're gonna. You have to remember that the that the EU is very close to the United States, right? Um, so, you know, there's going to be a push um, for anything that the U.S. really moves forward. I think the the EU will tend to follow. I mean, we look at, for example, this big push with, um, you know, between Russia and Ukraine. Obviously, all the Western countries immediately had an alliance, U.S., Canada, 
you know, the big superpowers in, in Europe, you know, obviously, you know, it, um, Germany, France, um, you know, Australia, New Zealand and in Asia Pacific, you know, these basically 10, 11 big countries came together, you know, really supporting uh, Ukraine. And it's an interesting one because the, you know, we don't all, we never hear the other side of the story. I, I saw some comments here earlier from uh, Julian Assange and also uh, Patrick Lancaster. Now, Patrick Lancaster is uh, an American citizen who's been on the ground in the Donbass region. I had a chance to interview him several months ago about the Ukraine and Russia conflict. And I, that's one of my more popular videos on the channel. Um, you can look that up on this channel. It's done over 600,000 views, many, many views. Many people love that interview. And that interview, I think I was very fair. I, was, I don't have any bias. I'm wanting to learn about the region. I'm not an expert on Russia-Ukraine relations by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but, I, but I'm like, here's an American who's lived on the ground firsthand in the Donbass region for the past eight years. This is somebody that speaks Russian, that, that is on the ground asking people, what is your perspective? What is going on? And that was an important thing. Now, Patrick has been demonetized on YouTube. He does not make any money off of his YouTube videos. Um, and basically, even YouTube has said, anybody you youtube in our partner policy obviously as you know i monetize on youtube we have you know we, we we get we have run ads on our on our youtube videos um as a youtube content creator that youtube has told us that anybody that has anything that is pro-russian or anything that does not match a pro-ukrainian stance you will be demonetized that video will be demonetized or you will be deplatformed you know so you run the risk of um of this censorship and and so that's that's that this is a very common thing that happens and and so again i that's why i try to stay i really try to stay very neutral again i'm not saying you know i'm not being pro russia or pro ukraine i'm just saying look i'm a american citizen that wants to learn more about this patrick you're an american citizen that's lived on the ground for the last eight years there share with us your perspective and that's kind of what i try to do if i talk to people that go to on the ground in xinjiang Let's talk about it. Tell me, you know, what do you see abuses going on over there? Do you, what was your experience like? You know, I, I try to always approach things with a very uh, open mind. And I think that is uh, really, really important. So I think with EU, um, I think you're going to see, um, you know, Germany, for example, has had a very strong relationship with um, China over the last years under Merkel. Obviously, Germany has a new chancellor now. But I think that, um, again, you know, the United, uh, the EU is still very um, dependent on China as well. I think that they're going to have to find a way to work together and, and hopefully, um, you know, uh, let's let's just see how that de that situation develops. Um, uh, there's a good comment here. I, I want Julian Assange to, to be free, just like Meng Wanzhou. Yes, I think many people, many, many people do. Uh, what circumstances will possibly force the U.S. to befriend China? Um, I don't know. I don't think that there's really any circumstance. I mean, it, it's it's just going to be. The United States sees China as a threat, and it's 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 an unusual relationship, like I mentioned earlier, because we're so dependent on China. You know, it's it, it's it's something that you know we're basically saying two opposite things at the same time. China is the greatest threat to the world, but we also need China for the future of the American economy. That's kind of what the U.S. is saying at the moment, and so I think that is um, it, it's we're going to continue with the struggle for a long time, and unfortunately, I just think we're going to continue to see more and more tensions being uh being being right risen up um all right um guys thank you so much any any other any other questions here i want to thank you guys we've had a great stream today i'm uh, just happy to be back in the game here on youtube live i've been a little quiet this month as i've been preparing for this move got a lot of projects on the go also i had a really interesting video go out last night if you haven't seen it yet i want you to check it out it's about china and the metaverse. Uh, this is a video that I did a lot of research on, and I'm, I'm really proud of this video. I think it's really cool because there's some really unique um, concept videos that I share in this video. And this is something that I want people to understand about China. Uh, China is inventing the world, uh, the future of the world. I think it's 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 really incredible, uh, and and the U.S. is too. I'm not trying to say that only China is doing this. I mean, and I mean, there's amazing tech coming from China. There's amazing tech coming from America. Um, you know, we need to learn from the best of each other. I, I had, I had, a, I was really funny. Um, I had, I had somebody criticize me on my video where they said, Cyrus, you're so delusional. You, you know, you, you think China is going to control the future of the internet? No chance. Um, you know, the U S is going to dominate it. And I think it's a very naive opinion because one of the most fascinating stories that I've personally seen is the rise of TikTok. 
I mean, this is just incredible. I think it's such an under um, an underrated story is how a group of entrepreneurs in Beijing could come together and basically say, we want to create a social media platform that is going to rival Facebook. And, and, and it has absolutely changed everything. I mean, TikTok has changed social media completely. And let's be honest, even if you are doing Amazon selling, if you are doing all of this entrepreneur stuff, TikTok is the future right now. Facebook ads are done. I mean, Facebook ads are just not what they used to be. And uh, I mean, TikTok is is just dominating. I mean, it is just, and, and again, that technology is from China. They were the forefront of short video format content. So, and that caused every other social media network, for example, Instagram and Facebook, obviously owned by the same company, but they pivoted their strategy because of China. So we cannot come into that being arrogant and thinking, oh, Facebook and America, we're the best at everything. No, we need to come in with a little bit more humility and, and TikTok is the best example of that. I mean, again, uh, what China has done with that social media platform has been nothing short of just ge genius and brilliance. And um, I, I think it's uh, I think it's incredible, to be honest. It is it is really, really good. Um, here we go. Uh, thank you for my uh, Van Hock Wang uh, for the uh, for the super chat there. Really appreciate you guys. Thank you guys all for the super chats and the support to the channel. You guys are so generous and so um you know, amazing. I'm just so happy with this community. 800, you know, over 800 people through the stream today for not having streamed for over three months. It's pretty awesome. And um, I, I really want to thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, in the future, I want to do more of these live streams. That's a promise that I'll deliver to you guys. I know I had a lot of people say, Cyrus, hey, it's great to see you back in the game. You know, we've missed you on the live streams. We love this. I love answering the questions live. So I want to thank you guys. And um, um, yeah, any, and let me just go over the last comments here. TikTok is the world's most uh, uh, dominant, uh, most downloaded video. Uh, U.S. is starving millions in Afghanistan and Yemen, helping give the military equipment for human right abuses. They won't bat an eye. That's it's so true. I mean, that's the thing with Saudi Arabia, right? You know, the United States sells billions of dollars to Saudi Arabia to, to support their the civil war in Yemen. It's it's a it's a huge double standard for me, and it's 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 just I, I, we just cannot get over that. Uh, Rob Cameron, Vancouver will miss you. Well, we'll always be, I'll be always be coming back in Vancouver. Uh, I'll give you a, a, a hint on where I'm moving. I'm moving somewhere with better weather. Uh, one of the main reasons I'm moving is um, Vancouver. We we just really live in the rain here. <laughs> and I, I want to be a little bit closer to some better weather. So I'm going to be moving to a place with a lot of sunshine and a lot of uh, things happening here. Uh, chemical physics. U.S. should remove the mines left in Vietnam. Clean up the soil from the Agent Orange. That has poisoned millions of innocent Vietnamese. You know, I had a chance to go to um, Ho Chi Minh City, and they have the Vietnam War Memorial. And it is quite amazing to see that memorial because, um, you know why? Because it shows you the different perspective of the Vietnam War. Um, I've, growing up in America, we were actually taught that Although we didn't technically win the war, we kind of had a moral victory in Vietnam, which is wrong. We, we lost the war. There was no point. It was a completely useless war for America to be there. And by the way, you know, the whole reason why the U.S. started that war or got involved in that war was because of communism. We were scared of communism. Well, Vietnam's still a, a communist country today. Very, very, um, very clear that we didn't win that war. So, uh, but it's interesting to go in, and that's why I like going to new countries and learning, learning that. But when you go to that Vietnam War Memorial Museum, you hear, you finally learn a lot about this Agent Orange and how it has absolutely ruined the lives of millions of Vietnamese uh, still to this day, which is just heartbreaking. Uh, very difficult as an American citizen to go and see that, that war memorial. Uh, even, even my father, my, my father's a Vietnam War veteran. Uh, but I mean, you know, even talking with him, I mean, he has such a different perspective on Vietnam because I mean, he was a young boy. He was 20 years old when he went. He had no idea what, why he was there. I mean, he's he got recruited and he had to go. That's what his government told him to do. Um, Kevin Tilstone, say hello to our Hunan friends. Absolutely. Uh, Kevin's doing some great stuff. Uh, you know, he is uh, building links between China and the UK, um, you know, and all through seafood, which is incredible, right? Because China has great seafood, uh, great seafood culture. And uh, UK has some amazing seafood as well. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, there we go. Mansana, I have changed my Douyin name again. I've changed it to uh, Cyrus Wong Dejong. 
you wanted me to say something in Cantonese. Uh, Ika ho tono la <laughs> I uh, I need to have my breakfast. I haven't had breakfast yet. It's early in the morning here. And uh, guys, I'm gonna end it there. So guys, thank you so much for being a part of today's stream. I'm gonna see you guys very soon and uh, expect some more exciting videos coming out this next week as we are closing out the month of June. And also, I'm going to be uh, we're doing some more stuff on some Chinese social media as well. So if you want to follow, I'm going to have some Chinese vlogs coming out. So make sure that you're also following my uh, uh, Billy Billy Bijan Siqua Douyin. Uh, you also want to be following me on Chinese social as we have some new Chinese content coming out there. Guys, all of you are fantastic. I really appreciate um, all of you. Uh, ben, I'm going to uh, I'm going to go eat something. <laughs> I. Um, Thank you all for your amazing support, and uh, let's uh, we'll see you guys soon in another stream. Thank you, guys.